if you were here last night, you know that you, we had a really remarkable talk by Professor Albright, uh, which indicates that marriage is part of the human good. It's part of human flourishing. And because it's part of the human good, there are virtues which are proper to marriage itself, but there are also just virtues of human life which relate to marriage. So something like what she was referring to is interdependence, the mutual care and support of each other, is certainly a virtue which is proper and, and relevant inside of marriage, but it's also just a virtue of human life. We live for each other, we care for each other, and we love each other. And if she's right, that one of the difficulties or challenges that we see is not merely a collapse of marriage culture, but really a collapse of human culture, then we're facing really an enormous challenge because the challenge is not only to revive marriage, the challenge is to revive cultural goods on their own. And that can be a somewhat of a, a daunting vision. If there's anyone that I know who finds daunting vision something to be unafraid of, but to rise to the occasion, it's Professor Robert George, uh, who's the McCormick Chair of Jurisprudence here at Princeton University, the founding director of the James Madison Program, and has had a distinguished and accomplished career uh, in a variety of sectors, uh, in politics, in academics uh, and in, in work like this. He, he really is a, re a remarkable person of almost unlimited energy. And everyone I know when they, when they speak of Professor George almost always remark on his hopefulness. He's someone who's involved in work like this, work about life, bioethics, marriage, all of these issues which for people of my own disposition can seem discouraging. And he never seems discouraged. He seems to be someone who takes hope, who knows the truth and is able to articulate it well, confident that the truth will out, uh, and men and women of goodwill will see their way to the light. Um, I think that what it, that reveals in the end is a virtue of magnanimity. Uh, Aquinas describes that as reaching out for great things, and we're really delighted to have him with us today. Well, thank you so much, Professor Snell. It's really a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to be uh, back. I've had the privilege of addressing this conference now for, I think, several iterations, and it's always a joy. Uh, let me uh, congratulate all of you for being here, uh, for being part of uh, this important movement. Uh, I also want to uh, thank and congratulate the leadership of the Love and Fidelity uh, Network, especially uh, Caitlin and Cassie and uh, Brittany. I mean, the work you're doing, well, there's just nothing more important. Uh, in today's culture. Uh, reviving the marriage culture, reviving the human culture, uh, is critically important uh, to the success of the human project. So uh, thanks for being part of it. Well, I uh, just have a few minutes with you this morning, and I don't want to take them all up by yakking at you. So I'm just going to make a few introductory uh, remarks and then open the uh, floor for, uh, for, for discussion. The great anti-Nazi hero and martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was a pastor. And although he never married himself, that he himself never married. <laughs> These days when people do marry themselves, you, you have to be very careful about the uh, way you phrase things. Although he himself never married, <laughs> he presided at many, many marriages. And he knew a thing or two about marriage. And one of the most profound things I've ever heard said about marriage is something he said. He said in advising uh, an affianced couple, preparing them for marriage, in the beginning, it will be the love that sustains your marriage. But in the long run, it will be your marriage that sustains your love. The commitment the movement of love from a mere feeling, from the effective plane, to the volitional, to what love truly is in its fullness, the active willing of the good of the other for the sake of the other. That, in the long run, is what matters. That marital commitment will sustain the love. I submit to you that Bonhoeffer was able to articulate that very profound, simple truth because he was the heir to a great tradition which bore within it a rich 
an accurate understanding of what marriage, in fact, is. It's not the only tradition ever to have articulated or understood that truth, but it was and is a tradition that bears that truth, that witnesses to that truth. And that truth is that marriage is not mere sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership. That it's something deeper and more real than that. That marriage is, in the words of the Bible, in the words of Genesis 2, rearticulated in the Gospel. And of course, this biblical source is what Bonhoeffer, as a Lutheran, is drawing on. This understanding of marriage as a one flesh union, or what Sharif Girgis and Ryan Anderson and I in our book, What Is Marriage, call a conjugal union. That is, a coming together of man and woman as husband and wife, uniting at every level of their being, not merely as in the sexual romantic companionship understanding of marriage that has largely now in our culture displaced the Judeo-Christian understanding, not merely at the affective level or the emotional level, a union of hearts or hearts and minds, but at every level, at the biological level, where man and woman unite as a reproductive unit, at the rational level, where volition is possible, the level at which it's possible actively to will the sake, the good of the other for the sake of the other, and indeed uh, at the emotional level, where the romantic feelings that are so pleasant come as the natural fruition of the true love that is the act of willing of the other for the sake of the other and the uniting with the other across the entire range of human being, the biological, the rational, volitional, the affective or emotional. Now, against that backdrop, that understanding, you could ask a series of catechism questions, and the answers would fall into place. What is the principle of rectitude in sexual matters? Answer, marriage. Considered now, not as mere sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership, but as a true conjugal partnership. Who unites in marriage? A man and a woman. For what term do they unite in marriage? Permanently, unconditionally. For richer, for poorer, for better or worse, till death do we part. Uh, how many people can enter this partnership? Well, two because the two make up the reproductive unit. The two unite in a partnership founded upon biological, bodily union. A bodily union made possible by the reproductive sexual complementarity of husband and wife. But just as a set of catechism questions can be asked and answered on the basis of a sound understanding of marriage as a conjugal partnership, so too a set of questions and answers, a kind of catechism, can be written out of the alternative understanding, the one that is dominant in our culture today, certainly in the elite sectors of our culture, but it's filtered through really to the whole of our culture, and that is the understanding of marriage as sexual romantic companionship or domestic partnership. Now, if you're willing to buy all the presuppositions of that view and affirm it, you can ask a set of catechism questions. What is the principle of rectitude in sexual matters? Consent. What makes sex good or bad, right or wrong? Not whether it's marital or non-marital, as in the conjugal view, but whether it's consented to or not consented to. Who can enter into a marriage? Well, anybody. 
any two persons of whichever sexes. Because it is actually just sexual romantic companionship, and two persons of the same sex can enter into that kind of relationship at the affective emotional level. If the biology doesn't matter, sexual reproductive complementarity doesn't matter, then of course two persons of the same sex. And then the next catechism question would be, only two? And the answer obviously has to be no, of course not. Three or more in polyamorous partnerships can enter into the bond, sexual romantic companionship. And so the famous Massachusetts throuple are every bit as much a marriage as Ozzy. Do you guys remember Ozzy? I was going to say Ozzy and Harriet, but only Brian, Zach, and I will remember who, and maybe one or two others will remember who they were. But just as much as Mr. and Mrs. Santa Claus. Will that work? <laughs> and for how long? Well, obviously not forever necessarily in an unconditional commitment. But since the essence of the desirable relationship is the good <coughs> feeling of the so romantic sexual partnership, sexual romantic partnership, for as long as the feeling lasts, for as long as love lasts. And where you're not getting out of the marriage what you went into the marriage to get, and especially where both partners are not getting out of the marriage what they went into the marriage to get, well, you might work on the marriage to see if you can bring it back. But if you just don't want it anymore, you ditch it. Because why should I stay in a relationship that I'm not getting out of what I hope to get out of? Why should I stay in a relationship that's just unsatisfactory from my point of view or from our point of view? There are even experiments now in some jurisdictions, not here in the United States yet, but experiments in some jurisdictions with the idea of formal term marriages. So you marry for five years, renewal, which makes perfect sense against the backdrop of the sexual romantic companionship understanding of, let's call it marriage, desirable relationships. Now, if I'm right, the catechism of the sexual romantic companionship idea of the worldview that Robert Bella once described as expressive or, or labeled expressive individualism, if I'm right, then that's wrong. That's a false. It's a false catechism. And it's going to lead people who enter into it down a bad road. And yet, that, of course, is the catechism that so many of your peers have imbibed. It's not as if they've thought about it and opted for it. They've drunk it in with the culture. And it is, after all, the view of the elite institutions of the culture. I mean, which of the two views I described uh, uh, corresponds to the view of the editorial board of the New York Times, or the faculty of Princeton or Harvard, or the University of Oklahoma, or Canyon College? I mean, th these questions answer themselves, right? And yet, if I'm right, that's a false catechism, right down the line. And if we're to critique it, if we're to transcend it, if we're to take ourselves and our peers to a more excellent way, then we're going to have to understand it. We're going to have to understand its foundations, its presuppositions, and its entailments. And we're going to have to much more richly understand than we have the sounder view. Part of the vulnerability of the sounder view was we were basically, the Judeo-Christian tradition, was relying on a catechism. People hadn't cultivated the garden. Most of our people didn't understand the basis of the norms that continued to uh, at least be paid lip service to in the culture until roughly yesterday. And recovering that understanding is therefore part of the project of revitalization and renewal that the Love and Fidelity Network is all about. But that means hard work. It means you're going to have to be doing work that your peers are 
not interested in doing and feel no need to do because they think they understand the truth. They've got the catechism. The vulnerability of the Judeo-Christian understanding or the conjugal understanding. I, I say Judeo-Christian, but remember, it's not unique to the Judeo-Christian tradition. Gandhi understood it. Socrates understood it. The great Roman thinkers understood it. All right, so it's not unique. But the vulnerability became evident when the attack was launched by people who, truth be told, should never have been regarded as very formidable. Margaret Sanger, Alfred Kinsey, Hugh Hefner, Herbert Marcuse. At least some of those names will mean something to you, I assume. They were able very effectively to demolish the residual understanding of marriage because the understanding was simply a residual understanding the very people who were holding and trying to live by the norms that make perfect sense against the backdrop of a sound understanding of marriage had no understanding or very little understanding left of the worldview, of the basic understanding of sexuality and the human good that alone could make sense of those norms. So before long, they were toppled and replaced by the new catechism. Okay, I want to stop there, RJ. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, please use the microphone so that we can get it on the live stream. So just raise your hand. Professor George will acknowledge you, and the microphones will come. Ms. Bono, right over here. Thank you very much, Professor George. Um, my question is, if the modern understanding of marriage is a sexual domestic partnership, um, then why do you think people want that label so much? Because if it's something that we can walk out of at any time, just like any romantic relationship that doesn't have that label, um, why do you think society still is so eager to put that label onto it? I think one factor I can think of is financial benefits that married couples will receive, but do you think there's something underlying that the term marriage and what it implicates could be uh, some sort of, um, that, that people find mm -hmm. some sort of deeper meaning in it that they want and some sort of permanence or some beauty in it, but aren't able to fully reach that? No, I see the question there, yeah, thank you. Um, it's important, I think, to remember that um, marriage is the formal principle of rectitude in sexual matters, not only in the Judeo-Christian tradition and in the culture that was formed by that tradition, but also in the law that was the fruit of the culture that was formed by that tradition. So the marriage, among other things, as a legal matter, is a license to enter into a sexual bond and to have children, in effect. It's indirect, but that's in effect what it is, okay? So, if you want a declaration from the culture and from the state that what you're doing, although it is not marital sexuality, is absolutely fine and dandy. If you want approval, then you want the label marriage. Even if yesterday you were claiming that marriage is just a terrible, horrible, patriarchal, bad institution that should be abolished. Still, you want it for its instrumental value, you want its legal standing, and for its instrumental value of a stamp of approval. And so you get a really honest and smart person like Masha Gessen, the writer Masha Gessen, uh, who, uh, who says, yeah, we should go for the label marriage so that when we get it, we can abolish it. Because marriage shouldn't exist. We, we, should, we should want, quote, equal treatment, unquote. So we want the label. If the other guys got the stamp of approval, we want the stamp of approval. But since marriage really is what we used to say it was before we decided to try to redefine marriage, we should have as our ultimate goal abolishing it. And I, I, I do admire her candor and frankness. 
It's a much more widely believed than it is articulated view. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Professor George. Um, I guess I'm wondering if we make the assumption that the expressivist individual understanding of marriage, only like the morality that consists there is only the residual uh, morality of our, our tradition, um, are we not going to fully understand um, what's going on? Does that make sense? Like, uh, I'm not going to try me again. <laughs> okay. Um, so looking at like the kind of overarching view of marriage in our society as just the only morality consisting there coming from Mar our tradition. Mar marriage is sexual right. romantic companionship. Right. So looking at that, all right. Um, so if we think of the morality consisting there as only uh, the bits and pieces left over from our tradition mm -hmm. that they're holding on to, I think we might be underestimating it. And I'm worried about that. Um. I, I'm, I'm not sure what to make of the uh, of, of the question. We're underestimating some. Are we underestimating the power of the sexual romantic companionship view? I think we're underestimating that there might be something really moral in that still. That's not just left over from our tradition. Yeah. I, okay. I, I think I get it, and and I, I think I half agree with that. Okay. Let, let me tell you the half I agree with, and I'll tell you the half I disagree with. I am a believer in the idea of natural law. People have a fundamental understanding of the human good that's very hard to erase. St. Paul says in the letter to the Romans that the Gentiles who don't have the law of Moses nevertheless have a law written on their hearts. It's a law that enables them to understand the basics of good and bad, right and wrong, even though they don't have the law of Moses. And St. Paul says it's, it's, it's sufficient, it's a sufficient understanding that they can be held accountable even by God, even ultimately. Uh, for doing the, doing the right thing. Um, and at, at the level we're talking about, I think people do have an intuitive basic understanding of the idea of marital union as something good. And often when people appear to be just going for the experiential component of that, just for the feeling aspect of it, there's still a longing for something deeper, for a genuine conjugal understanding, a comprehensive union, even at the biological level. People want to unite there. But I think, and here's the, the so I agree with that, so the half I disagree with is, I think that has been um, largely blocked by ideo ideological and other elements of the, of the culture that enable people now to see that only through a glass, only very, very darkly. Rather, the focus is on the experiential component, on the feeling component. Now, yes, they find eventually that's really highly unsatisfactory, and the consequences are measured in wounded relationships and broken lives and lots of bad stuff and all the social pathologies that you have when the individual tragedies multiply and you've got lots and lots of them. Yes, that's right. But that still doesn't mean that people will immediately or easily find their way back to a richer view. Let me take this occasion to, to say what I think is more generally going on here by way of background understanding. Do you know, it's, as those of you who've had courses in intellectual history, history will remember that uh, intellectual historians are very fond of breaking up the, um, the, the, the epochs into uh, the age of this and the age of that. So they tell us that medieval period was the age of faith. Faith was the touchstone of truth and of rectitude and of justice and so forth. But then along came the Enlightenment, and what do the intellectual historians call that? Do you guys know? The age of reason. The age of reason. So the medieval period is the age of faith. The Enlightenment is the age of reason, when now the touchstone of everything, the goodness, justice, rightness, is rationality. Well, we live in the postmodern period. And we now live in an age that I call the age of feeling. So the touchstone of truth and rightness and goodness is feeling. In fact, your very identity now can be um, understood in terms of what you feel or how you feel or what you feel you are. Now that, that, that in turn rests on a whole bunch of interesting 
uh, philosophical anthropological <laughs> presuppositions that I've been extremely critical of in my, uh, uh, in, my, in my writing, and we need not go into them. But in an age of feeling, people will think that the real truth of the matter of this or that, of who I am, of what our relationship is, of what our relationship, re relationship should be, is how it makes me feel and how I feel about it. So rather than supposing that we've got to tutor our feelings to bring them in, in line with what we know by faith and reason to be true or good or right, we now think we can understand what is true and good or right by reference to our feelings. And if reason or faith stand in the way of that, time to declare reason in error and faith in need of reinterpretation. Uh, yeah. We have about three minutes left, so it should be the last brief question. Cole back here. Capture it on the tape, Cole. So, so yep, they'll bring you the microphone. Just go, just go, for it. Just go for it. Okay. Um, so when I when I speak to more of my more socially uh, progress, I think it's related more to the first question. When I speak to my more progressive friends, um, the emphasis is always on the devaluation of the call it friendship broadly understood between, say, two gay men um, who, who want the the benefits. Um, intrinsic and extrinsic of marriage. Do you think that social conservatives might be able to offer a more robust understanding of, excuse that me, that was a robust, <laughs> <laughs> might be able to offer a more robust understanding of friendship as sort of the alternative for the yeah. groups of people that clearly want the benefits of marriage, but the biological complementarity just is it that's necessary? Just isn't there? Sure. Well, uh, I'm highly skeptical of uh, of concepts that are that are now taken for granted, but I think are deeply problematic, like sexual orientation, uh, or even uh, sexuality in the sense that it's used today, like your sexuality as opposed to my uh, sexuality, or the concept of gay and so forth. So, b believe it or not, I think there are real reasons to doubt all that stuff, including uh, most especially identities built around sexual attraction or forms of sexual attraction. But lay that all aside for a second. We, we can go into that sometime. Um, I'll tell you a little story that I think illustrates why the answer to your question is actually a negative. Uh, when New Jersey's Supreme Court handed down a ruling, utterly baseless, but you know how courts operate, say, directing the legislature of the state of New Jersey either to recognize same-sex partnerships as marriages and grant marriage licenses, or to establish a scheme of uh, domestic partnerships or civil unions uh, that provided the partners with all the benefits or incidents of, uh, uh, that they would get with marriage licenses. Uh, I went down to uh, the legislature to testify on behalf of the civil unions bill. Now, I am not a supporter of domestic partnerships or civil unions. I have lots of reasons for thinking they're bad. The legislature was confronted, though, by the court with two alternatives, either the marriage licenses or the civil unions. So I had a very simple proposal, very simple proposal. What uh, Jonathan Rauch, who is someone on the other side of this debate, but a very reasonable person, uh, labeled neutral unions. He, he put the label on my proposal, neutral unions. What the uh, proposal was, was to permit any two persons, irrespective of sex, and irrespective of whether they were permitted lawfully to be married. So for example, siblings, let's say a pair of widowed sisters who uh, were sharing uh, accommodation and financial responsibility and taking care of each other and needing to visit each other in the hospital and needing to have insurance benefits and so forth. Any two people, whether or not they were in a sexual relationship, would qualify for eligibility for civil unions or domestic partnership, okay? Every same-sex partnership in the state would be eligible. None would be excluded. But in addition to those, anybody else who was in exactly the same position 
needing the same benefits, including people who legally couldn't be married or legally couldn't even enter into sexual relations, like siblings, since we have incest laws, would also be eligible. Uh, do you think that the uh, movement in favor of redefining uh, marriage suppo uh, supported my proposal or opposed it? After all, they wanted more people to have the benefits of of, of marriage because they were in these relationships where they needed to visit each other in the hospital and have insurance coverage. I think you can guess what the answer was, which is the knockdown evidence that it was in the end symbolic. It was about whether we are going to throw the mantle of legal approbation over certain sorts of sexual conduct that had traditionally in our law as well as our culture been regarded as intrinsically non-marital. Thank you so, so much.